This is Lesson 2 for Module 6, Wind Farm Safety. Talk about the need for wind turbine technician health and safety training, basic health and safety objectives, communication strategies and communication equipment, the need and use of documentation, evaluating training effectiveness when you're dealing with training programs on-site or off-site, outside training resources, evaluating the training and measuring results, occupational hazards, safety management elements, requirements and use of personal protective equipment, safety requirements for records and documentation, training areas and processes, a general idea of what's to be expected with any training plan by the training institution, also standards and regulations. Okay, the need for wind turbine technician health and safety training. Wind turbine technicians are required to possess knowledge pertaining to the design, maintenance, and safety procedures that are associated with a variety of wind turbine sizes and designs. Wind turbines have many obvious safety hazards. Hazards such as the danger of falling, confined space, and electrical shock. Maintenance procedures cannot be performed safely without knowing the less obvious hazards. In addition to confined spaces, fall protection, and electric shock, there are dangers such as injuries from falling objects, also injuries from sharp, pointed, snagging objects or edges, particle contaminants and dust, slippery surfaces, the need for locking movable devices into place, lifting and straining injuries, crushing or pinching equipment injuries, trip hazards, noise, especially when using power tools and other maintenance or construction equipment, pressurized system dangers, harmful vapors, and also misuse or disuse of personal protective equipment such as hard hats, glasses, gloves, safety tools, EPA regulations, and also MSDS is sometimes misused or not used at all. Falls are the number three killer of workers within industry and it is the number one killer in general construction. The increase in insurance and worker compensation has forced some employers out of business. With this, employers' use of comprehensive safety programs have been put into place. Numerous site surveys have been and continue to be performed by competent inspection personnel, and they are used by the wind industry to assign rules and select proper safety gear and PPE. Many safety hazards can be eliminated by design changes when found early on in the safety hazard surveys and also with engineering recommendations. Changes such as caution labels, protective covers, backup systems, hatches, lighting, monitoring devices, railings, shutoff devices, and hand or foot grips are just some design changes that make working on a wind turbine safer for technicians. Not all safety hazards can be addressed by changes in the design or layout. These hazards become the technician's responsibility. These include working with functional moving parts, power systems, looking for falling ice from the top of tower blades, also trip falling hazards, and vapors from equipment and proper use of tools and PPE. Health and safety objectives. Fall hazards. Identify fall hazards using inspections and documentation, also OSHA and ANSI standards. Know when to use and be able to identify the fall hazard protection equipment that is needed. This equipment could be fall arrest positioning systems or suspension systems. Also the understanding of carabiners, D-links, and snap hooks. Here we see a, a diagram of the fall arrest equipment. You see this particular, this may be a tag on a device that is designed for fall arrest. A safety line goes to a harness, and this protects the person in the event they actually fall off of a structure. Fall positioning systems really limit the distance you may travel while on a structure, so it prevents you from falling over the edge because you can't get to the edge. That is the idea of a fall positioning and travel limiting system. Another objective is to understand and practice preventative care and inspection of the fall protection equipment. You need to learn how to properly care for the equipment using basic preventative procedures and the manufacturer recommendations. Also important are other methods of inspections for your equipment. 
You need to understand and practice the use of this equipment. Technicians must understand that not all hazards can be eliminated by an engineering approach, and these hazards are the technician's responsibility. Training is further validated by the use of an evaluation form or checklist pertaining to whether all usual maintenance tasks performed were subjected to a job hazard analysis. A written program takes into account changes in procedures and or equipment design. Methods of tracking the suggestions. Additional recommendations by workers are also taken in. So while doing on-campus training, this is what's expected of you as a trainee. You understand that the tasks performed were subjected to a job hazard analysis and the equipment that is used is the proper equipment according to codes. Also a written program is needed to define any changes that may have occurred since then, so any updates need to be provided as well. And there also should be a method of tracking any suggestions to the training program and this helps to document the concerns and changes that may arise. Additional recommendations by workers or trainees should be considered as well. This helps to evaluate and validate a training facility. An outline addressing each hazard and prevention methods should be reiterated throughout the training session. Falling objects result in injuries, hard hats, and visual assessments of the area. Awareness and cleanup of equipment and tools is also helpful in preventing injuries due to falling objects. Sharp pointed or snagging objects or edges. To prevent this, you need to wear proper clothing, protective suits, vests, gloves that may resist tearing or snagging against sharp, sharp objects, glasses, hard hats, the awareness of possible hazards, signs or paint to indicate these hazards needs to be included and suggest design changes such as saying perhaps a cover or rubber edge should be put on this device. It will help engineers if possible make the device better suited for maintenance procedures. Particle contaminants and dust, clean device filters and use respirators, also cleaning of braking systems and suggest design changes. This is all to prevent hazards and injuries which is our main objective in this lesson. Also slippery surfaces can be prevented by using grips on those surfaces, slip resistant shoes or boots, and of course identifying the slip areas like near gearboxes. It's also important to lock devices into place when and where necessary, such as locking the rotor into place to prevent injuries from the rotating shaft. Lockdown controls should be understood and to, to prevent accidental disengagement. Lifting and straining injuries are also common. You need to know your limits. Also have an understanding of how to properly lift equipment and when to seek help. Crushing and pinching equipment injuries can be prevented by locking components into place. Do not step or place hands in the moving parts area. So just keep hands clear. Ensure gears and mechanisms are not exposed or moving while performing maintenance. And shut down hydraulic systems or other systems that may become energized, causing crushing or pinching injuries. Trip hazards by cleaning up a spill quickly and properly. Also using caution labels in areas such as steps and general awareness of your surroundings. There's also the risk of fire. Spill cleanup procedures also cover that. Checking various seals and gaskets. Also fire prevention lessons and how to extinguish different types of as well as material safety data sheets. So you understand what type of material may react with another and it, whether a material may spontaneously ignite in certain temperatures or whether it is reactive with nearby components that may cause a fire. Shock or electrocution. You need to know the lockout tagout procedures while doing this training on campus. 
also have an understanding of the equipment, the use of energy dissipating suits, high voltage gloves and tools, and how to test for power properly, noise such as the use of power tools and equipment you need earplugs or earmuffs, with pressurized systems, system pressure, and also the awareness of where possible leakage points or breakpoints would exist. Harmful vapors also exist, so you need to be aware of fiberglass resin vapors, vapors from adhesive and component additives and other fluids. The misuse or disuse of personal protective equipment such as hard hats, glasses, gloves, safety tools and so on. You need to understand and always use the proper PPE for the job or task. The personal protective equipment required for a certain procedure may differ from job to job. The risk of falling, the proper use of equipment, and its upkeep. Okay, so that brings us to communication strategies and communication equipment. Hazard communication is very important within the field of wind turbine maintenance. The use of material safety data sheets and labeling is common for maintenance fluids and cleaning materials. It is important to perform maintenance properly and to understand how to clean up spills or leaks according to EPA standards. As an example, if gear oil was spilled onto the ground, the EPA requires the oil-soaked soil to be dug out to a specific depth and replaced. There's a lot to consider with moving around containers of oil and any other required fluids. Common, possibly hazardous materials in wind turbine maintenance include cleaners and solvents, which may contain sodium tripolyphosphates, also sodium metasilicate and sodium carbonate, which are all irritants. So oils are used, and this poses environmental concerns. It generally has a low toxicity. There is some concern with it being carcinogenic, though. Lithium grease, which uses black carbon, which is a NIOSH X listed carcinogen. Synthetic oils and grease, which uses a lithium complex. It's considered for the most part to be non toxic, unless ingested, of course. Fiberglass dust, since the blades and the cell housings are usually made of fiberglass, this is an irritant when it breaks loose and becomes particles within the air. It makes it an inhalant irritant as well as a skin irritant. Ceramic and organic brake dust. These are cured organic resins. Barium sulfate, which is an inhalant irritant. Graphite calcium carbonate is an inhalant irritant. Mica, kaolin, fibrous glass, as well as crystalline silica dust, which is also quartz dust. Hazard communication is a key part of wind turbine maintenance technician safety training and should include the following procedures. Signage, that is how to recognize signage and hazard communication labels. How to properly label components, what to label on the components and why. Material safety data sheets, that is material handling, use and proper cleanup. This is an environmental protection agency requirement and it poses restrictions and hazards associated with a particular material. Recognizing safety zones during component hoisting or maintenance. I'm using reflective clothing and why and when to create safety zone barriers. Communicating effectively ensures the attention of coworkers. Lockout tagout procedures. We need to know the proper way to fill out tags for different lockout tasks. That brings us to documentation. Documentations and handouts, material safety data sheets, approved written procedures, which are called AWPs or OPS, job hazard analyses, hazardous material handling, actual safety equipment and instruction inspection pamphlets. Here we see the AWP. These are approved written procedures for work on a particular turbine. And here is an inspection pamphlet for a fall protection harness. The results of improper safety procedures. Um, here in the bottom photo is a result of not using the proper PPE. In this case, just gloves. 
was a slight gash in the thumb nothing too big but it could have been prevented just by something as simple as gloves statistics need to be provided on certain hazards and cost analyses on injuries so you know how much it costs the company when codes and regulations are not followed some businesses may be fined thousands of dollars for not following OSHA guidelines methods of testing and written examinations best method for an instructor to evaluate his trainees should not only focus on tests but also on the trainees expected performance on the job to achieve this the test should be created from specific learning objectives again you need to know that this presentation is to give you an understanding of what's to come with on-campus training or on-site training after this lecture I would not consider students to be best informed on safety practices uh, and the use of equipment because you are not on campus that makes it difficult to become familiar with these tasks the instructor or trainer should make certain that the test focus exclusively on well-defined objectives the instructor should encourage his or her students to posit new ideas from various discussions while training methods for evaluating these exams should include hands-on safety skills and also should include hypothetical situations special circumstance discussions and further studies should be limited though on examinations a test should be formatted to thoroughly examine definitions situational responses and associated safety standards the common test format should be limited to multiple choice short answer essay matching and importantly demonstrations as we unfortunately cannot do as a hybrid or online course group safety tasks observing the trainees working together helps the trainer understand the work skills and attitudes where spotter or group tasks would be performed out in the field this allows each trainee to gain an appreciation for the fact that their own life may depend on the actions of others we do not get to experience this in an online course this is to be completed at an on-campus facility or on the job site group safety tasks are important and should always be utilized for evaluation when dealing with how to handle emergency care and respecting lockout tagout procedures so since this course is being delivered online we can have groups of students working together basically pretending that they are on the job site and that their lives are depending upon the other and in some situations depending on the training your life may depend on the action of others even at the training facility so it's very important to understand the necessity for completing this type of training at the proper facility rather than just doing it online reviews of students are accomplished by evaluating their abilities as a group since most tasks out in the field must be performed by multiple technicians so you can expect when you go to these training facilities to be reviewed not only individually but as a group also with group tasks observing the trainees working together helps the trainer understand the work skills and attitudes they will have out in the field the trainees are able to evaluate the training by comparing their needs and the training content so at most facilities you should be able to be evaluated by the instructor and also evaluate the instructor or trainer and the program itself the stages of the program that may be evaluated are the program development the program design the execution and the trainees end knowledge this also ties to whether or not the course was developed following JHAs and OSHA or other safety standards. Another important method of evaluating training effectiveness is to perform an on or off site follow up soon after training sessions. This ensures trainees still have the skills and knowledge of the safety training. It should be performed soon after training to prevent possible injuries if someone were to forget or for some reason did not follow procedures there are numerous suitable training resources there are many videos such as climb training and safety equipment manufacturer videos and they offer further instruction on the use and care of the safety devices 
their websites will have links to care and use of their equipment. Additional training resources include facilities specially equipped for safety procedures that are associated with wind turbine maintenance. One place would be the Suzlon Wind Turbine Training Facility and they have operations in 33 countries with a great number of facilities. They do demonstrations, dummies sometimes to show you how fall restraint systems absorb the shock from a fall. Also how to wear your equipment and dangerous areas of wind turbine sites. OSHA's new wind response team addresses wind turbine safety and training as well. You may look into that as an extra resource. At the Suzlon facility, as well as our own, the use of actual wind turbine equipment helps students to understand what situations may occur when performing wind maintenance. And of course it's important to have part of a wind turbine, like this large nacelle where you can do the training, learn about how to tie off components inside that may be dangerous, and other dangerous maintenance procedures as well as towers where climb assist devices may exist. Here is a climb tower. It's just a lower section. It has three ladders, so three trainees may practice climbing with climb assist devices. So they gain an understanding of fall protection when using ladders. Evaluating training and measuring results to ensure best back on the job performance. Going back to the evaluation, that should involve whether or not the program allowed for open suggestions from trainees and others, a means of documenting suggestions and concerns as to the training material, just really any questions that needs to be open to discussion when possible. And if a suggestion is rejected, they need to support their reason. The trainee performance is compared to the desired performance accurately by tests, lab or group work, and quick on-site follow-ups. Occupational hazards safety management elements. All project or maintenance lead technicians must have access to material safety data sheets and emergency protocol in addition to all safety training methodologies. So these are the safety management levels in different tiers of the workplace. Any ordinary maintenance worker should have a great understanding of maintenance procedures and, importantly, safety procedures. Project or lead techs need to have access to data sheets and other emergency protocol information. This is, of course, to help benefit the techs. If they get into a certain situation or they're unsure, they need at least one knowledgeable person on the site with access to safety materials to help prevent accidents. General requirements for safe operation and maintenance. Applied hands-on practice and knowledge of all equipment and tools is necessary. How to maintain those tools and the safety equipment is also important. Other requirements would include an understanding of what faults to look for with tools and equipment. Also the various limitations of techs that are within the top enclosures of a wind turbine nacelle or if they're on a walkway. Safe handling of materials is the best methods for bringing materials up and down the tower which varies from design to design. A means of draining or checking fluids safely. They need to have an understanding of crush, high voltage, fall, and confined space hazards and prevention. Also an understanding of EPA regulations and material safety data sheets for proper cleanup and handling procedures. Continuing on, safe operating practices and emergency procedures would include working with high voltage and high current. And that deals with lockout tagout to make sure if someone is working on a circuit, the power has been shut down and will remain off. So all switches or breakers are locked out and tagged with the worker's name so no one comes along and turns it on. Also arc flash prevention and that deals with high voltage. Um, since high voltage has it's comparable to high pressure, sometimes there is an electrical discharge from one object to another and they may be several feet apart.
emergency descent procedures. That's in the event there's some sort of failure and there's no time to make the descent through the tower on the ladder, a faster escape route, such as repelling if necessary. Confined space and methods of aggress and fire protection. Methods of protection, of course, would include PPE, your personal protective equipment, your hard hats, safety glasses, reflective vests, gloves, steel-toed non-slip boots, fire and arc-resistant calorie suits, high-voltage gloves, earplugs and earmuffs, fire extinguishers, high-voltage detectors, multimeters, fall arrest devices, ladder fall protection or climb assist devices, headlamps, and thermal imagers. So they need to have an understanding of not only the maintenance procedures and safety procedures, but also a great understanding of how to use the tools properly and safely. Safeguarding and hazardous release control. Gearbox maintenance procedures help prevent leaks. Another part of hazardous release would not only be harmful fluids to the environment, but also arc flash protection. Don't open this cabinet. This is high voltage. It's as basic as it gets. Ensure that this circuit is discharged, so on. Inspections and testing. Inspection of fall protection or climb assist devices, hard hats, lanyards, and links needs to be performed. Stress testing the above equipment is sometimes necessary. That is, putting it through a little bit of stress to ensure that it's working. Maybe taking a, a clasp and pulling on it quickly with a good amount of force to make sure that it is in fact latching the way it should be. Other elements would include environmental and personal monitoring and control. Major safety training requirements for maintenance techs should be performed at the aforementioned training facilities on a regular basis. Requirements and use of PPE, personal protective equipment. You need hard hats and you need to perform flex checks to find cracks in the hard hat. You basically hold it on the ends and bend it inward and slightly outward. This will reveal any cracks or breaks that may not be seen otherwise. And you must understand how to properly use that, the hard hats and what its limitations are. You need to know when to use glasses and when to use goggles. Also reflective vests. These are used while moving equipment or working around roads. And it's also for others to see you in any low light area. So if you're in construction and you're putting a tower up at night, it may be a good idea to wear a vest. That way someone doesn't turn and maybe bump into you. So if you're wearing a helmet light, it will also make workers around you more apparent. Gloves, high voltage gloves and work gloves are necessary. You may have two layers of gloves depending on what type of material you're moving. Steel-toed non-slip boots are necessary. And they may also be electrically insulated. Fire and arc resistant suits. These are fire retardant and also prevent arcing. So hard hats, how to check them. You need to understand the proper usage. Your safety glasses or goggles, reflective vests, gloves, the right type of shoes or boots and the right type of suit for the job, the right type of clothing for the job. Requirements and use of PPE continued. Earplugs and earmuffs, of course, need to be used with some equipment such as hydraulic torquing tools and other loud power tools. If you're working on a large tube type tower, everything echoes. I built grain bins and everything you do in there just echoes around. It is very loud. So you need the right type of ear protection when working around noisy tools. Fire extinguishers you need to have a knowledge of what types to use and how to use those extinguishers properly. High voltage detectors for use to ensure systems are in fact discharged or that lines have been powered off. You need to use multimeters for basic maintenance checks and troubleshooting and it also has a use in safety as well. Fall arrest devices, care use and limitations, ladder fall protection and climb assist devices, the care use and limitations of those, also headlamps and trouble lights. And this is as a safety accessory. Not only does it help you to see things, but it also lets others see you 
Also the use of thermal imagers as personal protective equipment. And this is to find dangerous hot spots that you may not notice until you put your hand on it or get near it. Um, and that may be an indication that it is failing. So it's important to understand how to use thermal imagers and how that ties into personal protective equipment. So here we see earmuffs, a fire extinguisher, a multimeter, uh, safety harness, uh, a cable type climb assist device, an extendable safety lanyard, a rescue kit, a high voltage screwdriver that's been coated and it's to withstand one kilovolt or 1000 volts of electricity. And here is a shot of a thermal imager. It's not anything that's of a safety concern. I just took a thermal image shot of a coffee pot. And these thermal imagers are, are handheld usually. They're somewhat rugged and they act almost like a video camera. You just point it towards an object and it will show you its heat intensity. You can even select certain areas and it will show the average temperature, the mean temperature for that spot. Safety requirements for records and documentation. All safety requirements must be documented to ensure the technicians have reference materials when required. This helps to prevent accidental misuse of equipment or a misunderstanding of the procedures when out in the field. It also helps to prevent blame and may be used to indicate whether proper procedures are or were being followed. Proper training areas and processes. Training should be conducted in a well-suited facility and the trainer must have actual field service experience, not just an understanding about safety procedures from seminars, classroom studies, and or media, which is what this section of the course is comprised of you need to go to a training facility through the institution to actually get proper experience and safety for wind technology. The use of ladders, climb towers, equipment lifts, component safety, and other components and means of aggress must also be included within the training area. See here a pneumatic bolt torque system. This particular one is being used to tighten bolts down to several hundred foot-pounds of torque. Here a trainee is showing his skill and using a climb assist device. Some facilities may have multiple ladders within the building to practice climbing. Other facilities may have actual towers. This one has three ladders so that three trainees may go up at one time and also training facilities should have actual components that you will run into in the field such as this 100 kilowatt wind turbine gearbox. This process is an effective tool when first evaluating in-class climb training and maintenance work. You can evaluate how well someone understands safety training devices such as climb assist or fall prevention equipment if you can't actually see them demonstrated. So this must be done on campus or at an accredited training facility. For most of this presentation, I've lectured on what to expect in a training facility and the, and the basics of what wind safety is comprised of. And now I want to talk about the training plan. This is what you would see in the training facility or here on campus. The training execution follows basic steps. There would be an introduction training outline with clearly scheduled tasks, uh, the safety concepts, statistics to inform students on how many falls there are in wind turbine industry. Um, that gives everyone an appreciation for safety equipment and an understanding that when it's not followed properly there are accidents and they need to see those statistics. Important terminology to understand from the get-go. Also OSHA, ANSI standards, things like that need to be discussed as an introduction and what those safety standard organizations are trying to accomplish. Discussions of known previous maintenance hazards, how they've been addressed and the other possible hazards. Also the responsibility of the employer, their training costs and the employees contribution, documentation of hazards 
and the safety reference materials such as MSDS, the procedures, etc. The responsibility of the employee to ensure hazard prevention procedures are put in place, that hazard communication is discussed and is used, also labeling, and safe work practices. Continuing on with the training plan, testing on material safety data sheets and procedures. This focuses on handling procedures and EPA regulations. As you should know, material safety data sheets are sheets that inform you of a product, whether it be a solvent, a piece of equipment, any form of material that you come into contact with in the workplace. And it shows how volatile it is, whether it has health effects, if it can be dangerous when mixed with other fluids and other information on a material. One example would be a material safety data sheet on muriatic acid. It would explain what type of gloves to use, what type of goggles, what not to mix it with, how to clean it up properly if it's spilled, whether it's dangerous when it's spilled. All of the important data on that particular material is included within those documents. Training plan also needs to cover exercises on personal protective equipment, climbing equipment, fall prevention equipment, and other hazards. Also care and upkeep on those. Safety when working around moving parts and electricity. Proper shutdown procedures and lockout tagout. Recognizing problems with equipment and staying alert. Emergency training. Additional discussion topics comprehensive on-site evaluations. One thing that's an important part of the curriculum is to ensure trainees understand what faults to look for, such as this gate on this clasp not closing on its own. You need to be tuned in to possible hazards such as this. A person may pick this up, the gate's shut at first, they put it on, they think it's latched because it should latch, and in fact it's held open. Of course, this would not be allowed to stay in service. It would need to be documented, returned to the manufacturer if necessary, or destroyed properly and discarded to prevent someone else from using the fault piece of equipment. Also, the proper inspection procedures and tagging of equipment is also a great part of the training plan as well. Standards and regulations. OSHA guidelines pertaining to wind maintenance include ladders and climbing, that's 29 CFR 1910.27. Fire prevention is discussed in OSHA 1910 subpart L. Emergency escape is 1910 subpart E. Electrical hazards, arc flash, are in 1910.269. Fall prevention is in 1926 subpart M. Fall arrest systems are in 1926.502, subpart D. Confined spaces are in 1915, subpart B. An example of a confined space would, of course, be within a wind turbine nacelle, also within a blade. The lockout tagout procedures are in 29 CFR 1910.269, subpart D, and 29 CFR 1910.147. Moving parts and machinery safety, 1910 subpart O. Cranes and hoists in 229 CFR 1910.179 and 180. Here are the fall protection video and online document URLs. These video links are contained within a document for this lesson. You will need to open it, watch each video. Again, this is not actual training. This is just a lecture on the material. Well, this is not intended to be an all-inclusive lesson on safety training whatsoever. The first video goes over fall protection equipment from DBI. The next goes over proper harness donning. There's also a fall protection equipment inspection video, the LAD safe ladder safety system emergency descent devices, the Rogeless Rescue Kit, Rescue and Descent Devices, 
understanding ANSI, fall protection codes, and fall clearance calculations. Some of these are videos, and a few of these over here on the right are documents that you need to review. They allow you to only put videos in that are 10 minutes or less, so since they limit the time, these videos are in four parts or they're in nine parts or seven or eight or something like that. So make sure you watch all of them. More than likely, it should go through the video and then give you the option of selecting part two, but in case you lose connection or need to close the video for some reason, um, the URLs for each video have been posted in that document. And these are videos that are pertaining only to certain manufacturer versions, and there are many different types of safety equipment depending on the manufacturer. So these are just a few examples of those. You will have some review questions in order for me to know that you, in fact, did view the videos and understand key points of the content. Terms for this lesson, Arc Flash Prevention, American National Standards Institute, ANSI, Climb Assist Devices, Emergency Descent Training, Engineering Controls, Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, Fall Arrest Devices, Fall Positioning Devices, Fall Training Facilities, and Safety Training Facilities, Group Safety Tasks and Group Learning, Hazard Avoidance, Hazard Communication, which is abbreviated HAZCOM, that would include labeling and MSDS, high voltage equipment, labeling, lockout tagout procedures, material safety data sheets, National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH. Sometimes you'll see whether equipment that is manufactured is NIOSH compliant. Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA. A lot of equipment that you may use is OSHA compliant. The design of safety equipment is included in OSHA guidelines and regulatory guidelines by other safety institutes and administrations. Also, the importance of on-site evaluations, all that's entailed with personal protective equipment, preventative maintenance, safety equipment upkeep, safety standards, safety training resources, signage, training in hazard communication. Okay, so for this lesson, you need to complete the reading. You should have already scheduled safety training at a facility or here on campus. You need to watch all of the safety videos online and take the Module 6 Lesson 1 safety quiz. So I know that you did, in fact, watch them and understand the key points. You also need to take the quiz over the reading and this presentation. So there are two quizzes for this lesson. Again, this is not intended to be an all-inclusive training lecture. This is just to get you started on what to expect at a training facility or here on campus. That's all.